I'm going to give you kind of an overview of um, the situation in, um, with wolves in Western Oregon. Kind of, the, you're going to be hearing a lot about the preventative techniques uh, in more detail. I want to kind of bring you up to speed on the with what the wolf population is uh, right now in this part of the state, how they got here, and then you know what we've already had to deal with in terms of, of livestock attacks and the preventative efforts that we've tried. Um, where did these wolves come from that are now in this part of Oregon? They came from the introduction of wolves in the mid-1990s in Idaho. Um, as Mike mentioned, in, they were introduced in two different spots, in um, Yellowstone National Park and then in the central Idaho wilderness, the Frank Church River and No Return Wilderness. Um, some were released in January of 95, some were released in January of uh, 96. I always want to make a point of this, you know, if there's anything you remember from my talk, please remember that this was the only time the reintroduction was done. I know there's rumors are rampant that we've been also adding and reintroducing them into Oregon. It's not the case that this uh, population, this reintroduction was extremely successful. Now, they were introduced in 95 and 96. By 2008, there were 856 wolves in Idaho. So they were very successful in recolonizing Idaho. That population then expanded into Eastern Oregon. This is where, you know, after uh, they filled up Idaho, the portions of Idaho, they moved into northeastern Oregon. Um, the, the wolves that we have here now are just moving from eastern Oregon into this part of the state. That started in 2011. It was the first known westward dispersers that we're aware of because they had radio collars. And, you know, we. <coughs> We, there may have been some that came sooner that were not collared, but the first ones we knew about began in late 19, in 2011. First one, and the most famous one, was OR7. I'm sure most of you have heard of him. He's the alpha male of the rogue pack down here. Um, he was collared in February of 2011 in the northeastern corner of the state. Um, yeah, he was an offspring of the Anaha pack in far northeastern Oregon. He was collared in 2011 and then uh, he dispersed in September of 2011 and headed west, went down, you know, through the Strawberry Mountains, headed up close to Burns and then probably got to the edge of the high desert and, and took a turn to the right and went west, got to the edge of Bend and didn't like what he saw there, went south and uh, ended up down in this part of the state actually. Uh, First showed up in November, December of 2011 in the Wood River Valley in Klamath County. Here's another version of that map. This was a huge event, I guess, because you know, one um, got he went into California, which caused a stir. But the fact that we had this GPS caller and was getting this data on his movements caused a lot of media attention. This is the from the British tabloid, the Daily Mail. So it was. Uh, in the newspapers in Britain. It was on the nightly news. There was a Wolf OR7 expedition that retraced his path from Eastern Oregon to, to here. And you know, I'm not trying to sell you on OR7, but I do want you to know that he's you know, just getting a extremely famous wolf. There's been multiple books written about him, and it's just, uh, um, it really captured the public's uh, attention. But he spent most of 2012 in California, in Northern California, roaming around a lone disperser by himself. Um, but then in 2013, came back up into Southern Oregon. Spent a lot of time in that kind of Howard Prairie country between, uh, um, between Ashland and Klamath Falls. Still by himself. And then in, uh, in 2000, in early 2014, where those yellow dots are, he, he moved up into the, into the South Fork Road River country um, and was settling in there. And then found out then in May of 2014, we got trail cam photos. OR7 is the gray one on the left, but this black female showed up and uh, they paired up. Uh, again, there was, I don't know that we'll ever convince people, but um, we did not plant oh, the, this female, so there would be a happy ending for OR7. Um, we collected its scat, did DNA analysis. It came from northeastern Oregon as well, so made a dispersal, dispersal trip, uh, probably similar to OR7. We just don't know where she went because she didn't have a collar around her neck. But uh, 
Anyway, it was, you know, pretty amazing so far from the portion of the state, you know, where we actually had a wolf population. We actually didn't expect uh, him to pair up, but uh, they, they found each other, had pups in, uh, in the spring of 2014. And, you know, again, big news story, the registered guard had cartoons about it and things like that. So, um, and they've uh, been in that area. I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but that's the rogue pack was formed then in 2014. And uh, they've been, been there ever since. It's still OR7, it's 10 years old now, but he's still, still uh, the alpha male of that pack. And it's the same female is there as well. So, kind of a, um, so some of the other collared uh, um, wolves that made a similar long distance dispersal is OR25 is another one, another Imnaha pack um, wolf that dispersed. He took a little bit of a different route. Uh, oh yeah. now he went up uh, over to the Mount Hood area, um, but then stayed there maybe a month or so, but then dispersed down into this same uh, Kind of went mostly to Klamath County, but the same south, south, southwest, south central Oregon. Then uh, another one, OR28, uh, was from the Mount Emily pack. Again, you know, a slightly different route, but a similar dispersal. You can uh, her uh, track is in the darker brown. You can see kind of the the lighter colored uh, orange is the path of uh, OR25. Again, kind of showed up in the same general area. OR33, another one from the Imnaha pack that ended up down this way. And, uh, oh, sorry. and OR44 also went down this way. It's, it's really strange. I mean, we call it, call it the Southern Oregon Trail. We had these six radio collared wolves that dispersed west of it and all ended up in either Jackson, Klamath, or Lake counties. Um, as, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, OR7's mate uh, came from that area too. It's, you know, we don't understand why they kind of funneled this way. And, you know, since then we do now have wolves in, in some other parts of the Cascades, but uh, just an interesting phenomenon that uh, all of these ones from Northeast Oregon ended up in this part of the state. Um, we also had a couple of black wolves in the Keno area in 2015 and 2016. Thought we had what might be another uh, a pack forming in that area, um, but they've kind of dropped off the, the radar. We have not been getting, you know, um, ODFW's had a lot of trail cameras out in, in that area between uh, Ashland and Klamath Falls, and haven't picked these guys up, so not sure what became of them. So, and, you know, ODFW's uh, areas of known wolf activity map for 2018, you can see you know, the vast majority of the wolf population in Oregon is still in the far northeast corner, but we have in the rogue pack, um, the indigo, which is a newly forming pack, the white river pack up to the north, and then the silver lake, uh, the wolves in the silver lake area. I'll talk a little bit more about, about these different ones in, in our part of the state here. And this is that red line on this map is the, uh, um, the the boundary, it's the boundary of the Northern Rocky Mountains DPS, it's called a distinct population segment. That's the population that covers Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and also the eastern third of uh, Oregon and Washington. So east of that line, wolves were delisted, uh, federally delisted in 2011, and uh, are entirely under state management. To the west of that line, um, they're still federally listed as endangered, um, so they're federally endangered in this part of the state. And I underline known wolf territories because, you know, we're not trying to suggest that this is all the wolves there are. I, I know there's a lot of some sentiment that we're not telling people, you know, that there's more wolves out there and we're, we're hiding that. That's not the case. We do realize that there are very likely wolves in other places that we haven't confirmed yet, but these are ones that we know and have documented. Talked a little bit about the, the various ones. As I mentioned, the, the rogue pack, been there since 2014. They've 
produced 16 offspring in that time. They bred every year until this year. From all that we can tell this year, they did not successfully raise pups. Um, OR7 is that gray one in the middle. You can still see the collar around his neck. He continues to wear that collar even though um, it hasn't worked function since 2015. But it makes it easy to pick him out in photos for sure. That darker colored wolf in the lower right is the, the breeding female for this pack. She's looking pretty old. She's a black wolf, but she's getting very white now, and that's a sign of, of old age. We're not sure how old she is. Um, OR7 is 10. There's five wolves in this picture. There's a couple of them in the background. Maybe tough to pick out from this distance. We know that uh, there's six in the pack right now that uh, we've confirmed. So. It has kind of fluctuated over the years from nine to four or five. So they, they've never been, never gotten really a, a huge pack, but they uh, lately, in the last few years, have been kind of in the five to six um, size range. This was caught on a trail camera. So, you know, most likely if you're in, in the dense timber country that we have around here, you rarely see wolves, but, you know, if you're out camping at night, that, uh, hearing them howl will be the most likely way you make uh, contact with the wolves around here. Um, another of the packs in this part of the state, the Silver Lake Pack, it formed in 2016. Um, it was two collared wolves, actually, OR28, whose collar was was functioning at that time as the female. OR3 was actually, as you can tell, three means it was the third wolf uh, radio collared in the state, so that goes back quite a ways. It was, I think it was radio collared in 2009. It's one year older. It's, it's also from the Naha pack. It's kind of redundant. You can see how what an effect the Naha pack has had on wolves across the state. Um, but it had just a, a VHF collar. It didn't have one of these GPS ones that, that beams the data you know, via satellite to us. So you have to go out in the field and actually pick up its location. And it, it dispersed, I think, gosh, back in 2010. And it uh, kind of lost track of it. Um, we found it in the Ochicos and then lost it in ODFW, and you know, whenever they were doing flights for for deer and elk would scan for it and didn't pick it up. And, we, and then its collar, I think, finally died. But it resurfaced in 2016 down in this part of the state. And these two paired up uh, and uh, started the Silver Lake Pad in, in Lake County. So just um, kind of on the Fremont Wyneema National Forest. Um, they then and had at least one pup. That's the OR3, the male there, and one of their pups in June of 2016. Um, they did um, have a, one depredation on a calf in September. Uh, OR28 was illegally shot in October of 2016 up on the Fremont National Forest. And, but they did actually, just in the last couple months, uh, it was announced that they did catch a person responsible for it and uh, had a plea deal that they pleaded to, guilty to, to killing it. So they were actually able to solve that case, which is unusual that that uh, happens, but it did in this case. But that kind of took out the Silver Lake pack since it was just the two adults when this happened. Um, but just this year, we got a trail camera photo, that one in the upper left, of, of two in individuals. We're not sure you know, exactly what the status of, of this pack is right now, but if there's two of them there, it's likely kind of reforming. And um, we don't have any evidence yet that they have pups, but, but uh, it looks like that pack is, is reestablishing in that area. Um, this is the, the, the White River Pack is up east of Mount Hood, partially on the Mount Hood National Forest, but uh, also uh, spent a lot of time on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation. And I have a few little video clips because uh, the Warm Springs tribal biologist Austin Smith has been doing a great job of getting little video clips from trail cameras. And there's a, they're all grays, and uh, but uh, they probably been there, you know, they were first discovered, or we first confirmed them last year, but they had probably been there a few years before, because uh, there were three wolves at the time, um, and so we're not sure how long they've been there, but they're, they're there now, and they've had, this, this is their pups. 
hearing the howl of the adults and, and getting all excited that food is coming back to them. So anyway, that's a big, big litter for the White River uh, pack, and so that's an expanding group in, in the North Oregon Cascade. Um, the newest one that was just discovered uh, this spring, or at least confirmed this spring, is called the Indigo Pack. It's in Douglas County, kind of uh, along the North Umpqua River area, is where it's, they primarily are. And they uh, just actually, ODFW's trail cameras just confirmed that they have, uh, here in August of four pups. So that's a new pair just kind of to the north of the road pack. We also have some indications, haven't been confirmed yet, that there's a new group of wolves just north of the road pack, um, up kind of Union Creek area, that area's north of there. So they're kind of filling in as, as we expected, you know, with the offspring that the road pack has produced and more dispersers and the growth of the of the northeastern Oregon population. Um, well, we're getting more wolves in, in the Cascade. Um, so now I'll kind of step into the, the livestock uh, situation that we've had with livestock in western Oregon, the attacks, and what we've done to try to, to uh, stop or prevent further attacks. There's, uh, some of it has been done by these lone dispersing wolves that I've been talking about, and then others by the resident pack. Primarily the one resident pack we've had uh, the Bapongas around here is the road pack. This is a, a bone pile that uh, the Silver Lake wolves found just south of Silver Lake. You'll be hearing a lot more discussion about the importance of cleaning up bone piles, but you know, this is one we had here in this area where this was really attracting you know, OR-28 and OR-3. Um, they were able to get this buried, and after they were, and this was in close proximity to, to a ranch and to a cow-calf operation. Um, once they got this buried, the wolves no longer you know, frequented that area. So really, you don't hear lots about it, but a huge benefit is to clean up, you know, if you have bone piles lying around, because that really, really attracts wolves and can lead to problems down the road. Um, so, I mentioned OR25 before. He arrived in the upper Williamson River Valley, which is, probably many of you know, in Klamath County, um, in 2015. And, he was alone, you know, dispersers often keep moving around, but sometimes they localize even though they haven't paired up, and this animal just did that. Um, and spent a lot of time in this uh, Upper Williamson River Valley. There's a, the Yamsey Ranch is in that area, and it spent a lot of time on this ranch. For quite a while, there was no problems, but then ultimately in October to November, um, it did attack cattle on the Yamsey Ranch. Dead one dead calf, two injured calves, um, kind of over multiple nights. <clears throat> so this, these were confirmed the wolf attacks. We had you know, the, this caller was showing that he was at the scene of the crime. So this was one of the first deterrence efforts that we launched here in, in uh, southwest Oregon. Put flattery fencing up around the pasture. Again, something will be talked about extensively later on today. Um, Radio-activated noise boxes. These are ones that, if, uh, since he was a collared wolf, it has a receiver in this box. And if the wolf comes in, it's within range of the radio receiver. It sets off strobe light and loud noises, machine gun noises, and things to to scare him away. It, it, the limitation of it is it only works with collared wolves, but we use that here. We did a lot of uh, night patrols. Um, Fox lights were used, and I'll look at that repeatedly. This, that's a, uh, a light that you put up out on a pasture. They're, they don't do anything during the day. And at night, they're light activated. And as soon as it gets dark, they start putting out kind of a strobe light pattern. Um, and it's this kind of a randomized pattern. They were developed in Australia for um, as a fox deterrent, hence the name. And they're pretty effective, you know, maybe not forever, but um, in terms of it's a, it's a new light, something, something new and different that's on the landscape and tends to, to make predators wary. Um, and our efforts at Yamsey Ranch were successful. The attack stopped, OR25 continued to be in the area, but um, did not have any more depredations um, at this ranch. And just one aside about OR25 and give you a little bit of a feeling for the distance that wolves travel. This, 
he had, that upper part of this map is the Williamson River Valley where I'm just talking about the Anzi Ranch where he spent a lot of time. But he would occasionally make forays to the south down just into Northern California. And he had done this once before, this in uh, April of 2016, but in this instance he was down in, in the Northern California and shot back up to that Yamsey Ranch area 70 miles in 27 hours. So it's an amazing distance when you figure most of that was traveled at night. Um, you know, it wasn't, uh, they use roads, but I'm sure a lot of it was cross country too. And so just uh, one of the things to me that's uh, just amazing from what we've learned from the GPS callers is the, their ability to cover ground. It's, uh, it's amazing. Um, he ultimately ended up moving a little bit to the west over into the Wood River Valley in Klamath County. This is just an example. This was in midwinter. There was almost two feet of snow in, on the ground in the Wood River Valley. And he dug through the snow to get bones that are lying down in there. Just, uh, Again, it's another uh, sign of what uh, uh, bone piles and how that attracts uh, wolves and what they'll do to, to find them. And then he actually, he shadowed the road back for a while. I think he was, you know, he was looking to, to find a female and was uh, shadowed that back for quite a bit. And then he actually killed a, a young calf near a prospect in 2017. Uh, again, he was, and there's the, the calf, and he was, his collar showed that he was there at the time. So, and uh, so again, we deployed deterrence at that ranch outside uh, on the Red Blanket Road, out of Prospect. Um, Flat fence again in these fox lights, and he left the area. We had no further attacks. You know, you never know with these dispersers. Possibly he never would have come back there anyway, but, uh, you know, deploying the deterrence, it did work, we'll, we'll, we'll take credit for it working, whether or not that, that was actually what caused it or, uh, or if he just was moving away. Um, he actually did pair up with a female, you know, that's him on the left, and this female, well, at least we believe it was a female, we never actually confirmed that in uh, 2017 in the Wind River Valley, but he was also illegally killed um, shot in the Wind River Valley in October of 2017. That case was not solved. Um, another of these one dispersers, OR33, he had this kind of a, a beige colored collar, which was unique. And he was just a very visible wolf. He, a lot of these are just trail cameras of, other, of the public, or people would see him on like the west side road there in, in uh, the Wind River Valley or by Klamath Lake. Um, so, a lot of detections of him, he, he went right into the city of Medford, that's, you know, Foothill Road right in there, right on the edge of the city of Medford in April of 2016, which was just kind of amazing, just roaming around. In fact, you know, if you went right from there back all the way up over to Lapine, again, another instance of how these things move. He, He'd be down in this part of the state, and then he'd shoot up into central Oregon for a while, and then he'd come back down, um, just roaming around. Um, and then he did attack goats and sheep near Ashland uh, in June of 2016. Um, he attacked uh, a goat on one farm, or several goats on one farm, and then sheep on another. This is just right, you know, just on the other side of the, of the interstate there outside of Ashland. And again, we launched deterrence efforts there. It's the same, same recipe, the flat fencing and fox lights, and, and successfully stopped any further attacks um, on these ranches. He actually got his collar caught in a fence and it got ripped off of him in, uh, what was it, yeah, August of 2016. So he still wore a collar, but he, um, no transmitter, so we lost any more data on it. It was actually sighted up, or we believe so, with that beige collar. It was sighted up near uh, Roseburg in, in October, and then it was actually found dead in the, over by Fort Klamath off the west side of the road. So we have seen a little bit of a trend, and this is dispersing wolves. You know, they're more visible, they're moving around, they're not kind of territorial, and so they're much more susceptible to 
to getting getting shot and, and Reginald Bulls up. Um, and then just in 2018, uh, we had this uh, wolf show up on a tree on the a landowner's trail cam on the Pistol River, a little surprise, this maybe is about seven miles from, from the coast. Um, and then another on a trail camera in Langley, which is just south of Bandon on the coast. So, and then we did have multiple sheep attacks near Lang Langley. Um, you can see on the right those red dots were in, in the September and October of 2018, a series of sheep attacks that didn't, the wildlife services agent down there, you know, as you could see it was a very different pattern than the normal coyote damage that, they, that he deals with down there. Um, <clears throat> what sure looks like wolf tracks in the sand, right, just on the coastal strip there, so they've just gone about as far west as they can go. Um, we deployed um, fox lights and flabby fencing again, and no further attacks. We didn't pick them up on a trail camera. We're not, you know, 100% sure that it was a wolf that did this, but um, it sure appears to be the, kind of the same sort of pattern of a lone disperser that was in the area and then, then moved out of the area. We're not sure you know, what's become of that animal, but hasn't been. Uh, there was another incident in early 2019 outside of Langlois too, but, um, um, but at this point we're not sure where this animal is. Um, so, getting back to the rogue pack and, and the depredation history of it, you know, as I mentioned, they first bred in 2014. It didn't cause any problems with livestock for the first few years. The first confirmed livestock attack wasn't until August of 2016. And then, since then, we've actually had quite a few problems, which I'll get into. One thing, though, is the problems it has caused have been very, um, very focused in specific areas. The Milmar Ranch, this Nicholson Ranch in the Wood River Valley, um, and more recently in Rancheria, which is just south of the Milmar Ranch, up uh, on the uh, adjacent to the Rogue River National Forest. And I, this is kind of a trend, usually in a lot of packs, where they. You know, it's not like they're attacking ranches all over their territory, or they tend to focus in on certain areas. Um, and so, I guess my point on that is it's not, when a wolf pack is in the area, it's not like all of the ranches are likely to be affected by depredations. It tends to be, you know, specific areas that are kind of chronic problems for us. Um, this is going back to when OR7's collars still work. The, these dots, that's the, the Milmar Ranch. Uh, They're the big pastures. Uh, when OR7, ever since he arrived there in 2014, would visit this ranch, we'd see these dots. In fact, I think there'd be like a dot at least every, at least one every month. He would kind of come and go. They, there were some bone piles uh, in that area. This is just showing they'd come in you know, it comes in in the middle of the night. That tends to be when you have most of the problems with depredation at night. But uh, they'd come in and they'd go. We um, didn't cause any, any problems at first, but they were attracted to the ranch, most likely by the, by the bone piles. And this is just showing like that's a dead horse that was lying there. Um, but we didn't have the first problems, we had, first depredations we actually had with the with the road pack, we're over in this Wood River Valley. I don't know if you are familiar with that. It's just, just west of the town of Fort Klamath. Huge pastures, huge amount of livestock in, uh, in that Wood River Valley. What's been kind of amazing in the history that we've had over there with the wolves attacking cattle is they've been very consistent in where they've gone. They've gone, um, you know, there's, there's pastures north and south, but they always kind of come into this one area on the Nicholson Ranch. They tend to go by the cow-calf uh, pairs, and the, all the attacks I believe we've had in Wood River Valley have been on yearlings. And uh, so they just kind of have a specific, you know, hunting profile, I guess, that they're looking for. So we had problems there initially in October of 2016. As I mentioned, these are huge pastures, so the, the flattery fencing was not an option here. There's just too many 
miles uh, that you would have to extend it around. So we did a lot of night presence uh, uh, patrols. We tried some fox lights. Fortunately, in this area, they they do. It's just uh, summer grazing, summer fall. They ship the cows out in November, and so we have We kind of and, and again another kind of peculiar thing about it is the problems always tended to be in the fall in the Wood River Valley. This in September is when they would would tend to come over to this part of their territory. So it was kind of this seasonal situation that we had, but we uh, implemented uh, again in 2017. Every time we implemented our deterrence measures, they were largely effective. The biofence was tried, that's where you put out a lot of scat and um, wolf urine to try to kind of create a biological barrier that they may not be willing to cross. They did cross it, I, so I don't know that it, that it worked, but um, we did manage through a variety of hazing and firing cracker shells at them when they are in the valley. We didn't have any um, attacks um, here in 2017, so it, the combination of things we tried did, did work. Um, when we really started having problems at Nomar Ranch was in January of 2018. You can see these calves were, one was on, found on January 10th, the other on January 11th. These were, you know, impressive thing about this is the amount of consumption in a short amount of time. It, um, they were just there, you know, like from maybe midnight to six in the morning on these things. They were probably not even that late. And, um, and these con almost the entire carcass was consumed, so it was clearly, you know, the, the whole pack or multiple animals were there. We deployed Fladry, had some night presence there, too. Um, and the, Again, the flat receipt seemed to be effective. We, you know, here, since we're dealing with a pack, and the Milmar Ranch is <clears throat> only about three miles from where they historically been, so it's really in the center of their territory. Um, but we had, we caught wolves coming in on trail cameras. They were around. Um, the landowner would hear them, heard them howling. But um, we didn't have any, after we put up the flat in January of 2018, we didn't have any more. Um, attacks and didn't have any sign that they were getting into the pasture um, and we kept it up till June and that's when they turn out so there were cows on both sides of the fence at that time so we take the flattery down during the summer but it, it got us through that winter um, but we had additional problems uh, a guard dog was attacked in September of 2018 on, on the Milmar Ranch we put the flattery back up after that it worked into November, but then um, in November of 2018, the flyby was breached, a calf was killed, and then another attack in December and in January. I'm not sure, you know, why it finally failed. I mean, flyby isn't really meant to be a, a permanent deterrent. It, it is a temporary thing, but it, it also might have been, in the winter months, it was hard to keep, the, it's electrified, you know, it's on a hot wire. And we were running it uh, off batteries and, and solar panels to charge the batteries. That gets tough in the winter time. I mean, you have you can have you know, weeks of cloudy days. The days are short and it is sunny, so you get less charge. And uh, so it's possible that it lost. Um, you know, the, it wasn't hot, and they tested it and got through. But anyway, it was pretty clear after these series uh, of uh, attacks earlier this year that they kind of. The flattery wasn't effective anymore for, for whatever reason. You probably heard, or some of you heard, anyway, that we tried the, the, the dancing men like they have at the car dealerships. Um, and it seemed to be effective at first, but then we continued to have problems. And so our solution here at Milmar Ranch is, in fact, we're starting next week, is to build a permanent uh, hot high t New Zealand high tensile wire fence. Um, be five feet tall. We've, we've been consulting with uh, folks in Montana who've done some permanent fencing to try to get a design that we think will be effective. Um, so, and you know, it's there's been some controversy about doing this. You know, we got funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service put in funding. We got funding from the Oregon's Compensation Program. Actually, Klamath Siskiyou Wildlands Environmental Group did a GoFundMe. A campaign, we were able to raise 6000 so it's kind of a, a combination of funds. 
I know there's concern that, you know, well, are we going to build every rancher a, a new perimeter fence? And no, that's not, that's not uh, going to be possible. But the, the reason for it here is just this is in the center of, of the road packs territory. It's been a chronic problem spot. Um, it is also one of the few ranches up in that country that where there are, um, they have cattle up there through the winter. And the winter seems to be the time of year we've had the most problems. So, so we're hoping this uh, will solve the, the problems that we've had there. Um, just a quick summary on livestock depredations. You know, there's, there's been research from the Northern Rockies. Not, not all wolf packs depredate. Some do, some don't. We can shift from year to year. Um, it tends to be concentrated in, in certain depredation prone areas. It's not just kind of widespread across the landscape. We, f we feel like so far the work we've done here, the pre preventative measures do frequently work. You know, we got the problems of Nomar aside, and you know, these are the variety of techniques we've used. You'll be hearing the rest of the day um, more about these techniques. Um, there is, uh, and I think uh, Steve Niemel will talk more about uh, there is a depredation prevention compensation fund that's run through ODA um, to get money for it. It's, it's a good program. It provides money for compensation of, of losses but, and also provides funding for preventative um, tech things. You guys, you can kind of see on this chart, quite a bit more of the money is going to preventative measures than to actual compensation at this point. So it's really good. It helps. It's done by, by county, like Randy Wolf is the the chairman of the of Jackson County's Wolf um, Committee. So it's, it's a good program to try to address some of these problems. Uh, I'll touch just quickly on federal delisting. Uh, we did, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a proposed rule in March of this year um, to delist wolves. This, you know, on this map, that's that kind of shaded area to the east is the DPS where they are delisted. The area of the lighter color to the west, they're still federally listed. That would change. The proposed rule would delist them in all of Oregon, Washington, California, actually throughout, throughout the country except for the Mexican wolf down in Arizona and New Mexico. And so we expect that usually you, it takes about a year between issuance of a proposed rule. We go through a public comment period. We have received an enormous number of public comments uh, on the proposed rule, and they're going through those comments now and should have a decision in the final rule um, by, by the middle of 2020. That's it. That's it. And I'd be happy to take any questions if uh, anybody has any. And I'll stop this. Questions? <laughs> Does I-5, I mean, we know that I-5 is a as any sort of barrier to the I mean, is there any evidence on their part in crossing the interstate? Yeah, we don't. Uh, OR-7, when he was dispersing, crossed it like twice, I mean, actually down in California. It's, I would think it would actually be a pretty formidable barrier. They have, in northeastern Oregon, they have quite a bit of data from colored wolves where I-84 through that country and they've had some instances where a collared wolf will get right to the edge of I-84 and kind of just hang there and sometimes take, you know, sometimes abandon trying to cross all together, but you know, other, other times they, they certainly do cross it, but um, it's, it's a pretty, those big interstates with a lot of traffic, even all night long. And, yeah. they, they're partial barriers, but they, they find a way. All right, thank you very much.